an independent private consultant that got a farm too in North Mississippi Delta, about 100 miles south of here. Uh, and you can't see all of that, but I'm just going to discuss some topics about, you know, the challenges that as, as a consultant and a farmer that you have growing cotton. And one of them is cost of production. If you look at your budgets, uh, and this, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from a consultant. I don't know exactly what land really is and cost of equipment is, but if you look here, at, I know what it what it costs when you plant and prep seed treatments. About a hundred bucks there. I'm involved in the in the weed management, whether it's burned down or pre-emerge, post-emerge, laid by. Cost another close to a hundred bucks there. You know, if you're in a bad pig weed area, it could be way more than that. Like Chuck hey, Farr said. Are all yours extended, everybody? Pretty much, yeah. No invest? Very little, but so. I didn't know who didn't have there. Yeah. It's a little bit, not much. Insect management, Angus knows all about that, you know, uh, $100 there, defoliation. So that's stuff that I, that I recommend and kind of know what it costs. Uh, then you got to add all your other stuff, your fixed cost in there. It can get up, I was talking to somebody on a budget deal a while ago, it said about $890 an acre to grow cotton. That's pretty good. You figure everything, I mean everything. Yeah, yeah. That's right. uh, insect management, I, one of our biggest problems in, this, in the bowl dark too has been the bowl worms, you know, coming through the technology. Always have, have had a problem with that here lately. Started with bowl guard one, then started over spraying that, and then bowl guard two started over spraying that. So, and that's where you typically find them there, you know, up under a bloom tag or right in there, or in, a, in a small small worm inside a bloom, you know, and then they go right into that bowl. Tucker, would you and my agents here? Yesterday, they spent a lot of time talking about sampling and saying if you don't sample the way they sample, you ain't doing it right. With blue tags in these days, this is the most confusing scouting I've ever done in my life. Because if you ain't scouting all the time everywhere, you're going to miss them. They hide. It's you a possibility, yeah. That's what that, you've got to look in blooms and old bloom tags for eggs for sure. And, 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 that, and that, would you agree? Yeah, and I, and I didn't mean it to be, I mean, I didn't, those comments in the round table weren't directed at if you didn't do it. I know y'all had some extreme. I could yeah, tell you what y'all see. It wasn't really that you weren't doing it right. I don't think there's a wrong way, but our thresholds are kind of based on uh, on a sample that's simpler, has to be simpler, you know, across people for it to, to work. But, you know, you take like Bob's dump stream. Bob literally gets on his hands and knees and marks out 10 foot of rub, but he's only checking a few thousand acres now yeah. compared to what he used to. And I watched him last year on his hands and knees go through every single fruiting structure on every plant on 10 foot of rub. And he was finding all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, you know, if I went and just sampled it like we sampled it, I'd get a quarter of what he was finding. Wasn't that he was doing it wrong, but our threshold was really designed to sample it like we're sampling. It accounts for the stuff we're missing. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and I don't understand the Twitter, but I do follow you on the Twitter, and I keep up with what you put on there. You know, and that's what I was yeah. getting at as far as the meglades and yeah. the moon tags and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that, here's, I was talking about the thresholds. We went through that. And, and at, all consultants have different ways of doing it. You know, I'll, I'll go and I'll take a terminal egg count. I'll take, I'll pull blooms, pink blooms, white blooms. Then I'll look at dry tags and I try to kind of get a good feeling of, you know, what's going on. Got moss traps up, flushing moss. You know, you're looking, you're looking at all this and it's always kind of a, a gut feeling on, on, on that. And then you, we're going to have the wide strike tree and the bogar tree and then we're going to have to learn how to manage that again with uh, letting, letting the technology work. We're going to do it for a a couple of years and just see how it works, but knowing that we've got the fifth protein in corn, I don't know how long this thing will last. I don't know if anybody's predicted that, but we'll have to be on our toes on the bow guard three. Uh, then plant bugs is another key insect in my area. I left off thrips and aphids and angus to touch on those, but we, you know, we got problems with everything, but these two, the bow worms and the plant bugs are the two major ones that I deal with. 
and this has been a problem, but you have to really manage for plant bugs. You can do a lot of different things to help. We've got improved sampling techniques and thresholds now that Angus will be able to work out for us. We use sweet nets, drop cloths, visual, dirty blooms. You know, we get just a, like a gut feeling, you know. You just do all these sampling techniques to try to get an idea. Uh, try to keep your cotton away from corn if you can, because they'll migrate out of there. Uh, try to manage for earliness. You don't want to get a, a, a late material variety that gets plant bugs in it and it runs you late. Diamond is a new insecticide. I say not, it's not really new, but we use it a lot. It's really good for us. Uh, we, without it, we'd be hard pressed to make the yields we do. And then mixtures, tank mixes with transforming acephate, acephate and diamond, transforming diamond. We mix it at all. High rethroid, acephate, diamond. You know, we mix all kind of things up to try to not use the same thing, you know, over and over and over. Uh, short intervals, if you have got heavy pressure, sometimes that's all you can do. Uh, and then do, do what you can for planting date and early maturing varieties and transform it. It says new chemistry, not really new, but, but uh, it's, a, it's a good one for us. Uh, variety selection. Uh, we've, we've been trying to find a Bogart 3 cotton variety that would yield as good as our Bogart 2s that we have, like 1646 and 1518. They've always out yielded the Bogart 3s that we've tried. And so, you know, a lot of the farmers in the area say, well, I'm going to plant my Bogart 2 variety that I used to because I know it's going to it's going to yield for me. And if I have to spray it with a diamide, I'm still money ahead because of the yield. And see, you can see some of the differences there uh, on this one. But uh, in 2019, the gap is closing. We've, uh, we've got some newer varieties now, some old guard threes that are closing that gap on yield. So it's, it gives us an opportunity to try some more bold guard threes. Uh, that fightage and wide strike, it led a lot of tests this year in the uh, OBTs in our area. Well, that's why I was asking you about yeah. the enlist technology. Yeah, and see, it's gonna, it's gonna, it, they're gonna have to have the enlist soybeans <laughs> get, get a, uh, take a halt, and then you might see a, a, a big uh, switch over. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, we've tried the, the, the Delta Pine 18, 35, and 45, and it's just, you know, just doesn't yield like we need it to yield. Uh, and then, it, it, you know, if, if you're just talking just basic varieties on your OBTs, you know, you can uh, you can make a bad decision on a variety and cost the grower money. And that's a challenge for a consultant to make sure that, you know, these guys ask, well, what variety do I need to plant? Well, if you, if, you, uh, if you look at all those locations, the highest yielding variety here, uh oh, I hit the wrong button. Highest yielding variety is uh, 1534. Medium, lowest is 12. You know, so you could leave uh, 290 pounds on the table if you just planted the wrong variety, or even if midway in the pack you could leave 160 pounds on the table. So that's that's money that and, uh, we need to. That's a challenge. You need to know their soil type, their land, their practices, how they manage, and whether they're whether they're good, you know, growers, and you know, you got just kind of figure all that out. So Tucker, as a consultant, do you tell the farmer what variety they need to be planting or do they say, hey, we're planting well, this? Some of both. Uh, and, and we look at all these OBTs every year. About four, four or five of my growers will have a trial on their farm so they can look at these things. But they're, you know, they're, they're hesitant to change a lot of times. If they've got one that they, that they like, they know how to manage. And so, you know, but once they see a, an opportunity, let's say a Bogar three that will, that will yield as well as one of theirs, they'll try it. But it's a. Uh, have you, you know, all, have you ever gotten a look at any of uh, I, well, three things that graduated back in May. I worked for Bayer for four summers, and then through the fall, we were trying to get me transitioned over to the old Monsanto side. I worked for uh, looking at. Copyrights at the time. Uh, I got to hang around for a little bit of that. Y'all looked at any of the class of 20? Yeah, yeah. I've had I had three three NPE varieties on a couple of farms this year. I was gonna say that's yeah, that's some of the best out of that in the 500s. Yeah. 
They look pretty good. We're going to try some. It's just complete. Uh, uh, see how much they're going to have away. Yeah. That's going to be the key to it. And then we, we talk about control of bow worms with insecticides. Uh, I'm all, I've always been a, a, a proponent of using the high rate. And you can see the differences here. Prevathon and besiege, both diamides, if you if you go with the 14 ounce rate, it's not as good as the 20, the full 20 ounce rate, keeps it below that, that damage line. Same way with besiege, seven versus 10. So when I'm spraying, I'm not gonna cut rates. I think you can get in trouble doing that. I have a question. And, and I agree with what I'm saying. I'm in Tennessee, so I'm at the very northern tip, and we don't treat full worms to the top of Now, we got in trouble with that this year. We did treat some, and more than should have been treated. My point being, we use a lot of 14 because we don't really need that whole window that you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But now that's an extreme, and I ain't, I'm not saying we don't need to use 20 when we spray. But that, that's what Scott Stewart would say too for that area. Right. For that area, yes, yeah, different area. Right. But you know, we're at the point where a high reef or an oil theme doesn't work for us anymore. Oh, yeah, no, Once we know. used to overspray with that. Right. You know, now it's got to be a diamond out then. Pretty much now in my area, with that pressure, I, yeah, I think you, you're better off doing the full rate. That's just my opinion. The, the ones they compare it to, the besiege and the intrepid edge, as far as you're concerned, they're going to prep it. Well, perhaps on overseas, I don't really, I don't really have a preference. I think you might see a little bit of an edge with the Prevathon at 20 versus 10 with the seeds, but I mean it's not that much. Weed management, you know, we, we're in a bad pig weed area, and so far we've got to talk in every day, and I was depressed after his, his deal because they can't, they can't use Dicamba after the 25th of May. What's that? May 25th, Arkansas. So trust me, it's, it's rough. It's rough. It's got to be rough. And uh, and so we uh, we got this uh, up in north north edge of my territory. There, it's about as bad as I think is what he's got. Because that's you know, look at them. That is uh, that's tough. And uh, so we do we do the whole program like he does. We we we're gonna start using. Well, we'll have break on every acre this year coming up. Had it last year on a lot of it. Uh, it's expensive, but I think it works, especially to get the rainfall like we got. Are y'all mixing something with it? Cotteran? We put a, some, some, yeah, a lot of people put a little cotteran with it. Now, some guys that don't like, I got one guy that does not like cotteran. He won't do it. But then most of them do. And uh, they've been putting out cotteran and gramoxone behind the planter, and now they're going to break a little bit of cotteran and some gramoxone behind the planter. You know, there's more brown top behind, middle behind the break. I don't know. I used it yeah. on yeah. all my locations. Yeah. But I noticed up there on Sturgeon's and inside, and it may have been stuff, I think it was probably just already up. Yeah. But it turned white and it came back on. But it was still way better than what I've been doing with Cotter and Doe. Oh, yeah. Way yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And it was, you know, like somebody said. Teaweed, though. I had more teaweed, it seemed like. Yeah. Than normal. I don't know. We're, we're in Arkansas, the Doe, it's. Even where they're not saying that it's truly you know, resistant, we're still seeing it. It's not taking years long, unfortunately. Yeah, Dill is good. It's, you know, when we started, you know, using Dill, we, you know, we've had to up the rate and do it more than once, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's getting thin for sure. And you got to be prepared, you know, you got to have, you got to have some spraying power to cover all this at, you know, at the proper time, you know, if the pig weed is, grows what an inch and a half overnight or something like that and if you can get six inches tall you can't kill them so you uh you got to have you got that stirring stuff over there out of the shed you got to like you know he's got like three of them things and you got to roll when it's time to roll you know you know i got another guy that's got like nine road hooded sprayers not row sprayers but broadcast hoods you know that he, he, when he starts on the big ways he can he can get with it and then we're talking about the cover crops. You know, we, we, we've done this. They did that on Bowen Flowers' place up north last year, two years ago. And uh, that is a good, that's a good pig weed, that's a good pig weed uh, control. That's on a bad, bad place up there, uh, up north, up there, on his farm where they are so bad, where the, I showed you that other picture. And that works. Uh, 
it, it's, it's a headache to plan into and it's a headache to know if you've got to span the cotton. It takes a long time. you got to go out there and dig around and move that grass to see if i got to span it. It drives me crazy. But that's, that's after it kind of starts to melt down. And I told Angus, you know, the thrips pressure was way less. I don't know why, Angus, because they get into cover crop or it just, I don't know. But I thought the thrips were going to be a problem because I, it was down in there and I couldn't get to it anyway. But we didn't have any thrips problems. Yeah, they, they say that in Georgia showed this. We showed it. It's about a 30% reduction in thrips mm -hmm. going to some kind of no-till cover crop or whatever. They think they just impede their ability to find the crop. They don't really know it was definitely. But you can see that the pigweed deal right there is, you know, and, that, and normally that would just be solid pigweeds. And then you got, you know, you got challenges of using different technologies, whether it's a uh, enlist or extend. And that's that's some that's some extend cotton that got drifted on or volatilized on from a neighbor that had enlist cotton. So that's why it's hard to plant both technologies in the same area. Something's gonna happen. And uh, that that came through there and buggered us up pretty bad. The weather, there's nothing you can do about the weather, but that's a challenge working around. You get too much rain in August and you get a big fruit shed and washes it out to the middles. And then you, then that complicates uh, diseases. And I don't know if y'all can see that, right? But when we're talking about, about worm eggs and stuff, that's bacterial blight, a legion on the bowl. But if you look right there, that's a worm egg on a dry tag, and that's one on a, on a uh, brack that's got a, and two eggs right there on a, a dying bloom tag. So, you know, you don't just have eggs in the terminal, you got them all over the plant. You got bowls that size, and you got the size of that, let's say, the size of this bowl here. And then you got egg there, egg there, up there, you know, so that's a challenge. And the diseases are telling. Resistant variety is what we do for bacterial blight now. 15, 18 delta pine and 16, 46 is fairly tolerant, you know, so that's, that's the real one reason that we plant a lot of that. Bacterial blight leaf, angular leaf spot lesions. Right in there. Target spot. No, we didn't have too much of that this past year, but we had it a couple, two or three years ago in 15, 22. It was terrible. So uh, I don't really know if there's any fungicides that, that will help us. In my opinion, as a consultant, I keep, it, I keep the picks on it and don't let it get rank. And uh, try not to let uh, it look like that. That's target spot. And you can see, you know, it, it, I don't know really how bad it is, but it, it, it looks bad. I don't know whether we've lost yield on it or not, but we don't let it get that big anymore. So, Tom Allen put out this, I think, some one time, a fungicide application to manage the target spot. It's, and I can, I've got the yield increase, but sometimes, it's, you know, 20% of the time, so 80% of the time, fungicide is not beneficial. It costs a lot of money. You gotta make, you know, Cost fifty dollars an acre to do that, so you got to make a hundred pounds of cotton. And I just don't know. If, you know, I think you could do it a lot cheaper with managing the plant height of picks. And the cotton leaf roll dwarf virus is something you know that they talk about here and at the belt wide and all this kind of thing. And I had it last year, but I, you know, I didn't know what it, what it was. I heard everybody talk about it, so I started looking for it, and that's a plant right there that I found one of my farms was as tall as I was and the other cotton was not that tall, about like midway there. Nothing on it, maybe a bowl here and one there, and a little, maybe a little stuff in the top, but it's vectored by an aphid. Uh, I can say that and, and you can't keep aphids out of your cotton, so you know, and, you know it takes one, one aphid to do it in like 20 minutes or something like that. Something like that in there. Like 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they inject it, you know, they feed on it. And uh, they can they can vector that virus in there. Where, seconds. Were y'all seeing much uh, the yield loss from it? Because I know, I can't remember, late night stuff, yesterday about, you know, 
was speaking with Dr. Borland. Yeah. Uh, she was saying there was some yield loss, uh, Travis Foskey, our state. Uh, we didn't see any yield loss in Mississippi that I know of. He, and I saw some fields that were worse than what I, I you know, I had to try to hunt to find it. Yeah. And I didn't even, I wasn't even looking for it until late season, but I saw a field that Tom Allen had flagged off and had a lot of that scattered out in there. But apparently, it's one of Bruce's fields, apparently it did not cause any yield damage. So, I'm scared, I'm scared of it, I'm worried about it, but I don't think there's anything I can do about it. I don't know. Uh, our plant path guy, he just, when he kind of gave his spill about it when I first heard about it in the production meeting, he told everybody he's like, it's, it's not anything to worry about. I got to talk to him a little later about it, and he says he thinks it's going to be kind of a non-event. Just they're just going to get it and prove it. I'm just looking to see. We don't have it yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm just looking to see if it's actually. You know, well, I've heard about it. I've heard about the cotton blue disease in Alabama, and I've heard it was bad in places one year. But I don't know if it's the same virus. It, it, it appears that it will be a non-event. But we had it in every cotton field, and Tom Allen, every county we grew cotton in had it. Y'all had it in Arkansas. You did have it. Yeah. Um, but what we can't find is that yield loss. But the thing that people are still concerned about is in South America, they've documented up to 80% yield loss. So people are, you know, aware of it, but this may be a different strain than South America. Now, they did document severe yield loss, like in one field in Baldwin Kelly, County, Alabama, in 18. So people are aware of it, but we're not nearly as scared of it. We're just kind of stay in tune, but we're not nearly as scared of it as we thought we might be after seeing some of the, the levels that we saw in some field that didn't appear to affect you at all. So we're not we're not gonna really worry about it a whole lot, but people are gonna continue working on it just in case. You remember used to we have seen that in the Cayman seed and being bigger plant bigger is that what you say it's just a little bit bigger plant? It looks like you know I, I, I would say something like that and go out there and big people type, you know, but right. I'm but glad. this is not it's the you know, it's, yeah. okay. it sticks up kinda of like that, but it's kind of a bushy yeah. clumped up thing and the leaf symptoms or leaves are curled and that kind of deal. Yeah. And it'll be straight up and down, you know. And it's not every one of those big bull plants would test positive, but a lot of them do. They don't tend to, I mean, I had a lot of them in my own stuff, but you know, I had a good uniform canopy and it wasn't until toward the end yeah. and it shot up. It wasn't like you do it right at the beginning. That's what that's what I saw. I mean I didn't see anything. Everything else stuff. left about state level. Yeah, and then some shot up. Uh, one thing you didn't really cover to uh pigs or yep. growth regulator, would you just kind of Yeah, well, of course it depends on variety. 1646. 1646 takes a lot. I start, I start at the 8th and 9th node, and I put at least 12 on it at the 8th node. Maybe sometimes more than that, depending on the, on the conditions. And then, you know, I try, to, I try to stay within the label guidelines, which is hard to do. But if you've got good fruit retention, starting off, and like this year, it looked like somebody said, I think pigs work best than it ever had this year. But I think that was because of uh, good fruit retention early and uh, no hard lock, no bowl rot and all that kind of thing and uh, good insect control. Plant bugs were a whole lot uh, less or milder or whatever you want to call it, uh, by half of what it normally is, which will add to fruit retention. And we just had a good early crop and we managed it, you know, it was a lot easier to do. Because I know with some varieties that don't require much pitch, you don't put one shot on it and say, ooh, well, I might not have done that. 1819, if we look at historical weather, mm -hmm. wet years. In other words, if we can manage growth regulators in those years, then we shouldn't have any trouble with that. You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. what I'm getting at. But I, I know, especially in your area, 1646 gets away from y'all. It doesn't really from us. It'll get away from us if you're not careful. So if you need to plant it early, you need to start over there. So, I think I'm done. This is my only slide. <laughs> so it's, it's it's pretty easy. So we can uh, we can kind of continue the conversation. We go down whatever road y'all y'all want to go down. But one thing I was thinking of, Ted, you had mentioned earlier um, about the sample. And there's there's we would love 
we're having this conversation. In fact, I just got an email about it a while ago from the guy at uh, Beverly, my wife works for in our department. We got him working on some stuff. You know, in Mississippi, we have a percent, if you're looking at just worms, percent, 4% uh, live worms or whatever is a threshold. But I'd love to get away from this percent infestation because it's it can be real confusing to a lot of people and it's really probably not the best way to do it. In Arkansas, y'all have a, what I would say is a much better worm threshold. It's like worms per acre or something or per foot row or something yeah, like that. Right. And, and that that's probably a better better way. I worry about people's been for you know, 50 years doing percent, how to get away from that. But what we find out, I'll give you a great example, like this egg threshold. What I'd love to get to is a percent damage free or something to that effect, rather than a percent invested plant. So the egg threshold, we first come out with that about two or three years ago. So I got some consultants um, that'll walk through the field say so pull 100 blooms, put them in their hat, get to the truck, go through them, find 10 eggs, they say I'm at 10% egg, egg truck. Well, if you pull in two or three dried blooms off of one plant, then you find, say you pull three off of every plant. To get to 100, you've, only, you've looked at 33, right? So if you found 10 from a percent plant, you're at 30% eggs. Yeah, and we got both. We got people doing it every which way. So I got one guy saying, "Hey, I got 10 percent eggs," and I got another guy saying, "We're 30 percent eggs." So it causes some confusion, and we're actually working on this. And I, I can't. I was trying to look at it on my phone a while ago to see what, what Buster had worked out, but based on some of uh, one of our grad students' data and uh, some of the stuff that Whitney has been doing. Uh, with the value of each of the bowls and where they're located on the plant, he's working up some, some thresholds that we may start testing that gets it back to a more, gets away from the percent. I think it would be easier for y'all if, if this works out, but it'll, it'll change some things. But it goes back to what we were talking about, about it would take a lot of the variation now between the way people would build it. I mean, how, how much easier would it be if we could say, Hey, go out and look at 100 bowls, and here's your pressure when you find four. This percent plant thing is, is confusing. Well, where it gets real confusing is when the farmer said, or you tell the farmer, I looked at 100 plants, I found four more. Okay. I've got 40,000 out there, you saw 100 of them. If I do the math, oh my God, I've got 50,000 more. You know what I mean? Whatever that number is. That don't need to happen. You know what I mean? That's not what it's, and that's what I tried to tell them. That's not how it works. This is all. You know, and most people, you know, and the way we, we sample, for example, for worm, we kind of do a whole plant modified circle. You know, I'll jump in there and say, I'm only going to look at 25 plants. Because you know, you can't only look at 20 get a lot of So I go in there and I look at the terminal. I'll look at two or three bigger squares, a couple blue tag, a couple bows, and I'm off to the next one. And I mean, that's kind of just how I do it. But, um, well, some people look at everything. You know, to, to me, if you take a 100 acre feet, this this room represents a hundred acre field. I, I think I'd be better off to spend two minutes sampling over there, over there, over here, over here, than to spend ten minutes sampling one place. You know what I mean? I'd rather yeah, have a no, absolutely. random and, and get a real good picture. Now, if I hit some issues, you know what I mean? If my numbers are not two percent or twenty percent, somewhere yeah. in between, then now I've got to back up and do real math. But if you think about our threshold on those twenty-five plants, is just say I walked in, I was going to only do twenty-five plants. If I find one worm, I'm at four. I'm at a threshold. Finding one worm is that really a problem? Right. Probably not. You know, and it, it, it gets confusing. But we, I mean, I guess the point of all that is that we're constantly working on this stuff, constantly, and we get all this information from folks like y'all. Well, what y'all, in reality, what y'all provide is stuff that the people sell it should. Whoever made it, you know what I mean? That's in other words, y'all doing a lot of work to to basically verify the product. Which helps well, us and the farmer. Well, but, yeah, we, we do. And, and, but that's a good thing because you're getting the unbiased. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And we need that. Yeah. Now we're the farmer. Does. Yeah. Um, but it just it gets a little confusing, especially when you start talking about plant bugs and when they're coming back and you got our stink bugs showing up and then these and worms, you know. And of course, the diamonds do nothing for all the other stuff. That's right. So, it, you know. Well, see, it, a good example is we're like, of course, I work with FMC. They got Prevodon now. 
big hunt, but I've worked with them a lot. I test their products every year and they've been real good as far as, you know, looking at all these programs, but their position on Bogart 3, or Wide Strike 3, is spray eggs. Yeah. And look, I'm not mad at it. I, I told them, you know, or Don Johnson, all the guys, and I said, look, we just agreed to disagree. We're going to stand the same as in the room yesterday. And I said, we're not going to spray. And, but they're saying spray. And, you know, the farmer, believe it, he won't believe. But there's a reason they're saying that. As we move and get more acres of Bogart 3, they're selling a lot of prep on Bogart 2 now. We got away from that egg prep sale, and all of a sudden, prep on sale is to fall hard. So there's a reason that they're saying what they're saying, and we're saying what they're saying. Well, it, has there been any discussion? I, I don't doubt that Bogart 2 is still bringing an awful lot to the table. But has there been discussion about, look, man, it, it really ain't doing what it was doing when we were paying $25 an acre. You know what I mean? Or, or have they given them price breaks or something on the market? No, two. Two that we're having over brand sale. Oh, no. No, there's been a lot of discussion about right. it, a lot. We have beat Monsanto over the head for years about this kind of stuff, but they're, they're not going to do it. Now, one thing I will say that they have pretty much all done is they have the, the price differential between the Bogart threes and the Bogart twos is flat, sort of. They didn't really give, they didn't charge you more for the right. Bogart three, but what they have gone to which is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. They, they call it seamless pricing, where you can't really tell what the tech fee is anymore. It's like 1646 would probably cost you more than 1845 Bogart 3 because the variety is so popular and it yields better. So they're adding the cost on based on for, for variety performance. And it's really hard to tell what you're paying for technology. You can't even really tell it anymore. Uh, and that's all on purpose, too. But the good news is they didn't jack the price of twenty dollars an acre for Bogart three. So at least they did that. But no, in my opinion, we should be paying a whole lot less for the resistance, whether it's weeds or whatever. You know. Well, the whole argument about glyphosate. Why are we putting that in there? What is it doing for us? These days? But we we have been we've had this conversation with them over the years. But well, nobody here been plugged in. Well, as long as people keep buying it, they're going to keep selling it. You really don't have a choice. You got it. And I guess the only other thing I'll kind of kind of add and talk about, like I said, whatever, whatever y'all want, is uh, just kind of build a little bit on that, that diamond thing that, that Tucker's talking about. You know, it's hard to even tell the, the full impact of it anymore, but a few years back when we kind of came up with, and Dr. Jeff Gore came up with most of this, and we just kind of went with it, is uh, that early shot of diamond in those bad plant bug areas, the effects that it has for several weeks beyond that. Uh, and then we started getting more and more people doing it on a bigger and bigger area. And over the last few years, our plant bug sprays, they're always bad, and we don't spray them. But I don't feel like there was a time I was wondering in the Mississippi Delta were we going to be able to really manage plant bugs given the tools we have. But I think incorporating some of that stuff that Tucker had on that slide has really changed the game from plant bug management for us. Not that they're not bad, they're always going to be bad. But I don't fear them like I used to fear them. Um, no question about that. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, we were sprayed them every five days, and then diamond has got us another, like a 10 day interval line. Yep. And so, then moving your, your cotton away from corn, we did a lot of that research on one of Tucker's farms, and, that, and the farmer, the, the guy that, that we were putting all this stuff on, we were going out back in those days when we were kind of making a connection between corn and cotton. We were going out and doing all these samples, so many rows away from corn, doing them all over. Uh, Arkansas was a part of Gus was a big part of it. And uh, this farmer, a big farmer, where we were doing all this work, came out there while we were doing it, was all involved with it. Then we couldn't do it anymore because he refused to plant corn anywhere near cotton after that. And, and he, he saw it. Was. So we, we do have people that's putting all those things together. It's not just the diamond, it's a lot of all those things yeah. that he said. Well, now I've run some diamond, say, 100 yards out 
you know, we bought some cornfield early in June just because hell they kept coming. I mean, you know, we learned to cut the corn and, and they just kept coming. Two thousand seven. We got a picture we show all the time from two thousand seven. Uh, from there in Cleveland, we had 15 or 16 sprays on a corn edge. It was still almost zeroed out about 12 to 16 rows with like 15 or 16 sprays on it. That was probably one of our worst plant bug years in that, that area forever. But we, never, we couldn't even keep them under control back then with, with that many sprays. But nowadays, it's just a little different. But that's still, I would still, even count mowers, let's still say plant bugs. So early season, what for plant bugs? I know nobody likes to make a croaker, even though it's cheap. I heard one fellow say that's all he used. He was in here yesterday. I don't have a problem with the croaker around that pinhead square type area. Early. It's not. It's not great. If I put something else, if I put transform out in that same window, I'd kill one plant bug. But if the croaker will hang some square. At that time, that's all we're really trying to do. Once we get into bloom, is where I really, really don't like it. Sure. Um, but during that early stage, well, and I'm not sure. Uh, I think Gus maybe had the slide earlier. Most, when I say farmers, I hope it's only farmers. I'm afraid most people don't understand when we have a population we spray. If we kill 60 percent, that's pretty dang good. 60 yeah. percent. Well, farmer, you know what I mean. They want it. If you spray for trips today, they won't be able to two days to walk out that field and not have the trip. That's what they want. I mean, the, the reinfestation, you know what I mean? Yeah, and Gus said it good. We're not zero in insects, we're just managing them. Right, I mean, yeah, that's the yeah, yeah, good, good comment there. But no, just, I don't know, like I said, I don't have a problem doing the public early. It will keep square retention up. But not well, for what? It can use it one day. Yeah. yeah. And it's for the price, if I was farming, I'd be using get in the blue. Yeah, don't need to use it, but, you know, one of my buddies said it works real good when you ain't got the plant. Yeah, that's what, and I, I think that, and I sell, I sell pallets of it, but that's, that's the way I sell it, yeah. too. This is not a plant but material, you know, but, uh, your opinion's different. You know. I mean, there's things that, that we've seen, too, over the years. I mean, just planting early has a huge effect on overall plant. Smooth leaf varieties are horrible for plant bugs. You know, hairy leaf varieties make a big difference, but then the trade-off is they're also way more attractive to worms. So there's all kinds of little things you can put together that affects the, you know, the end. How did that Vitamin 400 do in Arkansas test? Uh, I saw Louisiana as it was topping them on the bugs. I didn't look at Arkansas. We got it up on. Um, I think it was real high in Mississippi. But no, I believe it was in Well, that's what I'm wondering. But I'm wondering, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, I know growers are interested in yield, but in an extend world, I don't know how much it will fit in. But I bet it's going to get some attention, which is going to cause more drift. Yeah. Problems. I was going to say, do you know about the enlist in Tennessee? The last one one season. I mean, he's yeah. a good farmer, and, and he, when I say the label, their label just is very vague, and he followed it very vaguely. You know what I mean? But he got 32 farmers caught. No, nobody turned him in. But he had one season, and he went back to, you know what I mean? Just, you can't, you can't upset all your neighbors. I just can't help but think, looking at the way that thing performed across a lot of locations, that some people are going to play with it more than they do. They're going to be putting more 2,4-D out. Well, that, and, and, and Big weeds aren't too terribly bad. They can probably manage them with something that yeah, living living, in, yeah. and uh, so, yeah. deal and still water. grow and not spray it. Yeah, yeah, and not try to spray it. Yeah. You know. But or, or they could save that for when the weather was perfect. Like I said, you know, so that they didn't. But some of the people I had got that. He got up, sent his guy out there one morning or something. Anyway, he sprayed during the inversion, <laughs> and then it went all the way across another one of my clients' fields. So I was in the back and I worked for both of them. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of rough. Yeah. And then there was another guy right around Tupperware or north of there, Tupperware County. They put it out one time, had no problems. The wind was right in the afternoon, went by, followed the label, blah, blah, blah. The second time they did it, it was an inversion or something happened, and it went. All forward directions. It's got like, like you said, it got everybody around. I just 
down we have got everybody so that we still have one guy and he's sprayed a 50 acre bottle last year at noon one o'clock prior to three o'clock that night it come up off the bluff and got i don't know five thousand acres and got you know back in the his own Yeah, I'm done with it. 